Hi, welcome to Mr. Dyer's Musings. I'm Mr. Dyer. What do you think all three of these have in common? Besides them being sharpening stones. Well, that's what we're going to find out and discuss today on Mr. Dyer's Musings. Stay with me. As always, I'd like to thank my wife and family for their unconditional support. I'd like to thank you guys, my viewers, for making this possible and taking the time to watch this video. And I'd especially like to thank my subscribers and my patrons on Patreon. You know, I, this video is kind of coming out a little bit late. Um, normally, when I do these videos, I do it in a historical costume, uniform, or clothing. Uh, but I just didn't have time today, so came home from school and this is what I'm wearing. And I don't have a natural background because as you can hear, in Ohio at this time of year, the cicadas, the crickets, the little peepers, the frogs, they're in full force. No matter where you go, if you're going to be near nature here in Ohio at this time of the year, you're going to get a lot of noise from those guys. So that's why I'm over here trying to be a little bit cognizant of that fact. So we are going to talk about sharpening stones and specifically we're going to talk about this one. This is an antique Boy Scout sharpening stone. It is the little round puck. Boy Scouts came out with several throughout the years. This was the first one that they issued, the puck type. And then they came out in the, the little rectangles and little sticks and things like that for pocket stones. Um, this is a perfect all round use stone. And it was made by the Carborundum Company, Niagara Falls, New York. Now I had to read it because saying Carborundum uh, when I'm not looking at it sometimes gets my tongue twisted up. The puck itself is about three inches wide and all it says is Carborundum brand official Boy Scout sharpening stone number 151 uh, officially licensed by the Boy Scouts of America. So hopefully if I can get you to zoom in on that and get a good view of it. And it's a, it's a little bit less than a half inch thick. It fits in your palm really well, as you can see. Now the old Boy Scout catalogs said that this is a two-sided, a fine and a coarse, like many silicon carbide or Norton stones. This one, as far as I can tell, is not fine or coarse coarse side. It, it seems to be all consistently a fine stone. Okay, now before we get into that, let's talk about the Carborundum Company and the processes and why we owe a particular gentleman and his young fascination with science a debt of gratitude for coming up with the process of making these things. The Carborundum Company started in 1895 and it lasted to the 1980s. It was started by Edward Goodrich Ackeson, who, you know, through his exper experimentation, actually came up with the Ackeson process of making carborundum, okay? He was born and raised in Washington, Pennsylvania. He left school at the age of 16 and he liked to experiment with uh, chemistry, especially, and electricity. In fact, he came up with his own battery, took it to Edison, and tried to sell it to him. And Edison was so impressed that he hired Ackeson to work in his lab. And then Edison, you know, through his experimentation and everything, or Ackeson's experimentation and everything, sent him on to greater things, and eventually Ackeson uh, stopped working for Edison, went to work for another company, and in that process, he was experimenting with um, uh, trying to come up with a, a false diamond, if you will, an artificial diamond. And he was trying to do this inside an electric furnace. He combined clay and coke, and he used a carbon arc to create it. Now, when we say uh, coke, we're not talking, obviously, about the illegal substance, and we're not talking about the drink. What we're talking about is the material that's left over from coal. Uh, once you burn coal, the really soft stuff, that's called coke. OK, 
okay? When you crush it up, that's what he played around with. And in doing so, he found something attached to that electrical arc. It was little pieces of carbon, silicon carbide. And he called it carborundum. He patented it, and he processed it, and it exploded. So he started using carborundum to make abrasives for uh, grinding wheels and for what you know most popularly used as sharpening stones. Okay, so that brings us to these, right? And this. Now, Boy Scouts of America, they started selling and working with the Carborundum Company. They started selling these pucks in the 1920s. That's the first time that I uh, saw it. Now, the catalog I have was 1920 and 1925. It was not in the 1920 catalog, but it was in the 1925 catalog, okay? Now, 151 just designates the type of uh, stone it is. It does not designate the grit and what we consider grit. Uh, think of it like their own product line. And there's not a whole lot of information that I could find about specifically 151. In comparison, though, it is a fine stone. It's not as good as a razor stone, a razor hone, but it was a super fine stone for the time. Now, I use this stone on my axes, my hatchets, my uh, my pocket knives, and my belt knives. I love it because it cuts fast. Now, when we talk about cutting, it's important to know what material that you're cutting. The uh, tools that I have, they are high carbon steel. They're not stainless steel. Stainless steel is a lot harder um, to sharpen. Carbon steel is really easy to maintain in comparison. Generally speaking, stainless steel will hold its edge longer, but it's going to take a lot more to keep it up. Whereas when you're outside and you're working in the woods, things get nicked or you know accidents happen or whatever, having a slightly softer steel that's more workable can get you back to work faster. So that's why I like about carbon steel. And if you're into bushcrafting, a lot of people like using their carbon steel knives as strikers for their ferrous sea arm rods. Okay. I don't do that, but a lot of people do. You know, I don't like altering my knives um, on the spine to give them that 90 degree angle for that purpose, but a lot of people do, and that's cool. So what I have here is I have sharpening pucks. Now these sharpening pucks are a lot larger than the Boy Scout stone. Okay, So what's nice about these, these are really good for axes. Um, and they're pretty portable all in all. This big one is a little bit heavier than this one and they have the different grit sizes depending on how much metal you need to remove. Okay, both of them have a fine side. This one's a thousand grit and this one I think is like a, a 320. It says right here on thing 320 grit. Okay, so 320 get grit is actually a pretty low grit. But not all grits, even though it says 320 grit, it doesn't mean that all 320 grits are actually the same. What that means is that throughout the filtering process of the powders that's used, it can go through a number 320 screen. So that might be why if you have a 1,000 grit stone on one brand and a 1,000 grit stone on another, it cuts a little bit differently, it acts and behaves a little bit differently. Okay, So a grit is a good thing to kind of go by in general, but it's not the end all be all of determining um, how fine that stone is, okay? The higher grit that it is, the finer it is, and that's gonna give a better polish or end result as you step up. If you're going to need to remove a lot of material, then you wanna to go to a low grit, like a uh, maybe a 180 grit, which I think is what this one is, or this one, I don't remember. But that's to get out a lot, you know, really big nicks. Okay, but generally speaking, once your tools are maintained, an 800 or 1,000 grit is really where you want to be. Now this stone here, even though I have no idea what grit it is, I can sharpen something on using this, and it can pop hair off, okay? It's a really great way of getting an idea of how fine your... Object is sharpen. 
depending on the tool, depends on how fine you also want it sharpened. Your belt knife, your pocket knife, you don't necessarily need those things like super razor razor sharp. You just need to keep them maintained sharp enough that it can easily process your wood, or process your meat, if that's what you want to do. When it comes to sharpening your axe, you know, it's a different type of grind. So a good way to test this is ultimately just driving in a chunk of wood, making sure it doesn't bounce off or skip off and that it bites into it, okay? So how are we going to use this little puck to sharpen? When it comes to an ax, the bevel of an ax it's going to be a convex grind like that. It's going to be kind of rounded, whereas knives tend to be um, more of this type of an angle. Generally speaking, 12 degrees uh, it could be up to 30 degrees, but usually no more than 30 degrees. 30 degrees is a pretty broad. That's going to be more for like a chopper, but um, 12 degrees is going to be your, generally speaking, 12 to 20 is going to be your pocket knife, belt knife range. So you're going to take your puck, I put a little bit of water on it, put a little spit on it, whatever works for you. You're going to lay it, I don't know if I can I'll try to do this. See how there's a gap right there on the axe? You're going to close that gap like so. You're going to keep an eye on it and you're going to make little circles all the way around it. And generally speaking, you do 10 at a time. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you flip it over and you do the same thing. You'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine and ten. Now I gotta do that on this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you notice, I kept my eye on the stone, making sure that that gap was closed. I'm doing little itty bitty circles. I did the same on each side. Now, take your thumb, the flat pad of your thumb, and just scrape it across. And if it's an improved edge, you're good to go. When you're ready to finish it, you always take your ax, like so, and you're kind of making a circular and downward turn. Okay, and you're going to do 10 of those. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. And you're going to do that on the same side. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay. And again, take your thumb, and you scrape it across. And you're just checking for evenness of the bevel. If one end seems to be sharper than the other, then you need to go back at it. Okay. And you're trying to uh, bring it, bring the bevel together okay all consistently all the way down not 
open, close, open, close, open, close, all the way down. It needs to be brought down all the way across. Okay, now once you have that, make sure to give it a little light coat of oil and you're good to go. You need to take care of your tools. If you take care of your tools, the tools will take care of you. Now that's the ax. Next is a knife. Whether it be a belt knife like this or a pocket knife, the process is the same. Again, you're going to close it up. As you can see, there's a slight gap and you're going to bring it up until it meets the stone. Gap, bring it up, meets the stone. And once you have that, and it takes some muscle memory to get used to it, you're going to go forward and across, kind of like a J in a way. So forward, like so. Forward and across. Forward and across. When it comes to the tip, because of the way that this is ground, um, in the straight raising community, we call it a rolling X stroke. Okay, so you're going forward, and then you kind of lift up just slightly on the tip just to make sure that it stays closed on the stone the entire time. Because if you just went all the way across, then the tip isn't going to get sharpened. So that rolling X stroke is what we use. So that was three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you have it face you. Make sure your thumb and your fingers are down, close it up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Again, you take your thumb, bring it across, make sure that it's even all the way down. And once that's good to go, Put a little bit of oil on it to keep it nice and clean, especially it being high carbon steel. It'll have a tendency to rust if it gets wet. And you put it in your sheath. So there you have it. That's how you use the older Boy Scout puck sharpening stones. I love this thing. It's really light, a lot lighter than this. And as long as you're just maintaining your tools, this is really useful. It is a finer stone. If you end up with your hatchet and you end up kind of accidentally getting a nick in it from processing meat or processing wood, it hits the dirt or something, then having one of these as a backup is really nice. But just on your person, having a stone like this is ideal. Okay. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please click like. Please consider subscribing to our channel. Please consider joining our patrons on Patreon and give financially. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. You give loved ones a kiss and hug, and I hope you take care. All right? Thanks for joining me.